Okay, thanks. Hi, I'm Linda from Shinteki. And uh, in listening to your talks today about recasting and simulcasting events, uh, we actually came to a lot of the same conclusions in resurrecting an old event. I think a lot of the uh, problems we deal, dealt with are very similar. The only difference, I think, is that instead of us offending GC by changing things, we just end up thinking they were idiots seven years ago. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, much easier to, to work for yourself seven years later, but there's also some issues. So. These are the questions we asked ourselves uh, when we were considering whether to run Aquarius again or not. We actually had talked for several years about wouldn't it be cool to run Aquarius again, fix up what we wanted to, and just it was a good event. We wanted to see if it would stand up. So the things that we asked ourselves when we were deciding whether to do this event or not, I think are pretty interesting uh, for other people who are considering rerunning or uh, digging up an old event, you know, a, bang, one through five or whatever. Um, you have something you ran years ago, you're wondering, is it worth it to do again? Um, so the things we asked were, how much work is it really going to be? What changes would need to be done to bring it up to date? And would anybody even want to play in an event that we already ran and is out there? So those were our, our main questions. Uh, our other question that I didn't put on there from last year was also, can we still run Decathlon 7 later the, in the year? which at the time we thought, oh, sure we can. This is going to be so easy. We'll just we'll run Aquarius and, you know, and, and then we'll run Decathlon 7. That uh, didn't turn out to be true. Anyway, so how much work would it be? Uh, actually, quite similar to what you guys were talking about with, with uh, recasting an event. Unfortunately, the, the two people working on this Aquarius event were Brent and myself. Uh, Brent, his favorite part of all games is writing the new puzzles, and my favorite part is finding the new sites. So those were both already done. So, so the fun work was already gone. Um, there was a tiny bit more. Um, we wrote a few new puzzles. We found a few new locations. So there was a, a small amount. That's the green portion on there. Uh, but the remaining work is essentially the, the grind. Uh, graphic layout, we actually, all the puzzles were done in an old uh, software program we don't use anymore. And now we use Illustrator. So Brent had to put everything uh, into Illustrator with a new graphic layout. So that was very time consuming. Uh, the clue construction takes just as long whether you know what you're doing or not. Uh, the permitting and the logistical things all are, are time consuming and are, you have to do them, right? Uh, so that, that stuff took just as long organizing the staff. So it was really, it was, it was 70%, 75% of, uh, of the work of running an event from scratch. Okay, so, uh, I have kind of two things that had changed in the world since, uh, or two ways things had changed between 2004 and 2011. So the first one I'll talk about is the changes that happened in the world, uh, which was actually quite a bit. Smartphones and GPS devices are now the norm. In 2004, I would say some teams had a smartphone with them in the car. The majority of teams did not. Uh, GPS devices, same. A few teams had them. Uh, they weren't great. And now everyone has multiple smartphones and a GPS device. Um, so uh, one example of how that changes the event is uh, if you're familiar with Aquarius, the first part is the Palo Alto scramble, where you go to several different locations in Palo Alto. Uh, as an example of how that was more of a challenge in 2004, uh, Low Key, Team Low Key, tells me a story. That was their first game ever. They showed up to play in the game, and about an hour into the Palo Alto scramble. Sorry, I'm a little bit of trouble. Can you speak into the mic a little more? Sorry, I, I have Perfect, a drift. Thanks. Okay, so about an hour into the Palo Alto scramble, when uh, most teams who were familiar with Palo Alto had finished up that scramble, uh, they decided to buy a map. So they, they didn't have a map of Palo Alto um, at the time, and they didn't have GPS. So that took them three and a half hours to do the Palo Alto scramble. Um, if they'd had a GPS, they could have typed in the names of the locations and uh, would go much faster. So that's one of the changes that happened. Uh, the navigation became less of an issue. Uh, and then uh, the other thing that teams have now that they didn't have then is solving apps on their laptops. Uh, while some teams had them in 2004, they were lovingly handcrafted by the people who had them on their machines, and uh, very few teams had them. Now you can just go online and be like, anagram solver, and you have one, and it's totally good. So uh, one example of how a clue is affected by that was the just add water clue, where you had a bunch of letters, and then you added two H's and an O, and it um, unscrambled. Uh, much more challenging clue in 2004. In fact, there was only one team 
who solved it so fast that we thought they had had some sort of supercomputer to solve it, like in Midnight Madness. Um, but of course, it was the Burninators, and they got to the end, and we said, man, how did you guys solve that uh, anagramming clue so fast? And uh, Wei Hua said, oh, I called Will Shorts, <laughs> <laughs> who is apparently an anagramming machine. So anyway, uh, nowadays, everyone can go online and essentially call Will Shorts. Um, OK. So, uh, and then the other thing I want to talk about is changes in the world. Some locations no longer exist. So here's my example of that. Um, here's Have to Have It in 2004. It was an awesome outdoor garden with like broken glass all over the floor that you walked on. It was really cool. Uh, and now here it is in 2011. It's an empty lot with small pieces of broken glass in the dirt. Um, so we couldn't use that location. Luckily, as it turns out, the store moved to a new location and had a new name, but most of the stuff was the same, and that was Nest Gallery. So we did end up sending people there. It was about two miles away. So that worked out, but we had to change several locations. Um, yeah, the other thing was um, we originally launched at the Aquarius Theater in Palo Alto, which is a cool little theater, um, but we had a game that you played in there that each team took one row of seats, and then we played sort of a rock, paper, scissors game where you got to move out of your row. Uh, there's only 14 rows of seats in the theater, so 20 teams could not fit. So we changed that location to an outdoor amphitheater, and we actually changed the activity to be more fun and wet. <laughs> so hopefully more fun, certainly more wet. Um, OK, so uh, then the other changes I'm going to talk about is the game community and how it has changed since 2004. And that's uh, quite a bit as well. I'd say the biggest change, and again, these are gross generalizations, not true of every game nowadays, uh, but sort of true at least in Shinteki's decathlon events, we've evolved to become more puzzly and less activity focused. And, uh, and I think um, Aquarius was a little bit of a missing link between the old school games that weren't as puzzly and the newer games that are more puzzle focused. So uh, the, the generalizations I'm making here are that the emphasis on the puzzles has increased in events and on good puzzles. Um, the emphasis on non-puzzle activities has decreased um, the driving distances have also significantly decreased, at least in decathlon events. That's actually a, a direct response from the surveys that we do after the events. Uh, Aquarius had a lot of driving, and every event since then, at least a few people comment, boy, it was too much. Even when it was 10 minutes drive between each site, people say, boy, that's a lot of driving, and we'd rather do more puzzles. So uh, we, we decrease it a little. I like driving. Um, OK, so uh, and the last thing in there is that uh, in general, at Shinteki, we've evolved the way we run events logistically. We just, we're not as stupid as we used to be. We, we know more what we'd like to do and how we'd like to manage the teams now. So we made some changes with that. We also have improvements in our Leon app. The little device uh, is much more responsive and, and a better tool now than it used to be for Aquarius. OK, so let's talk about some puzzle tweaks we made for the game community because it's different now. So this is the uh, sunken booty clue, which was a treasure map in a bottle. And uh, the first little change I'm going to talk about is that if you can, you can see in the first picture, the treasure map was actually folded in half and shoved down into the bottle. And the only way to get it out was to smash the bottle open, uh, which we thought was cool at the time. But um, also because you picked it up in a place where there was broken glass all over the ground. So we thought kind of hinted at that. Um, basically, we thought teams nowadays, they don't really want to do that, and we didn't want to do it at the new site. So we uh, didn't put the clue in the bottle that way. We put it in so that you could pull it back out. Um, then we actually changed the clue. i got to find my example here, though. OK. Uh, so on the original clue, you followed the twisty path just to get the order. Um, and there was a little poem at the top of the clue that basically gave you specific instructions on how to solve it. You identified each state, each island was a state, and then it was either forward or backward. So you counted in three letters from the front or back, and the instructions told you to do that. Uh, so the new one, uh, basically, you had no instructions. <laughs> <laughs> but it's OK. It's OK. Um, and you ID'd the states, and then the little palm trees were actually on the capitals. So you had to know the capitals. And then the path that connects them had a number of dashes on it, and you indexed into the front or back using the dashes. So it was a, a little step further, and there's just it didn't tell you how to do it. So that's kind of an example of how we changed things um, 
to suit the, the modern game community. Uh, and I'll just quickly mention also there's one unexpected thing that we hadn't realized had changed in the game community until after we left a puzzle in that we maybe shouldn't have. Um, so there was a convention back in the day, in the old school days, uh, pretty much every game had a destroy the clue to find the answer inside kind of puzzle. And uh, I think old school game teams could spot that pretty quickly, that things were a waste of time and that maybe you really needed to tear it open or smash it or do something with it. And we had a clue in there where you had to just, it was that thick paint and you had to like wash all the paint off with water and the answer was written underneath. And apparently that stumped a lot of the newer teams uh, because it, why would you destroy the clue? So something that we thought was a common convention turned out not to be true. So sorry guys, um, we left that one in and maybe should not have. Um, or should have had some sort of thing that told you to ruin it. Um, anyway, so that's just some of the changes that we could have or should have made. Um, one of the things we were really nervous about was that Aquarius had several activities that were not puzzles. And uh, we were a little worried that teams would get to the fountain and say, I'm not going in there. This, what do you want me to get wet? And then also there's one where you had to bury your teammate in the sand. And you, it's not a puzzle. You just get sandy and dirty, right? And so uh, we tried to set the expectations before the event and tell everyone, you know, by the way, bring a swimsuit, you're going to get wet, you're going to get sandy. Overall, I think I was really happy with how teams embraced that and said, okay, this is part of the event. Although there were definitely a few people who got to the fountain and came right up to the monitor expecting to be handed the clue. And when they realized they had to get in the water, they sort of rolled their eyes and went, oh, really? Are you kidding? But it was very few people. And, and there were just as many people who got there and ripped off their clothes and had a swimsuit <laughs> under and jumped in. So it, it worked out all right. All right. So um, one of the things we did because uh, we wanted to shorten the drives and also wanted to make the event a little more streamlined and more the way that our current events are um, is uh, we wanted to have all the all the locations fit the theme. And in the original Aquarius, we had a couple locations that were just game locations. They were The old school games just had standard places. You go to the gates of hell, you go to Sign Hill Park and climb on the letters. There's no water at those things. They weren't Aquarius based, but um, so we changed those out for ones that we thought made more sense. Um, and then additionally, we wanted to shorten the drive, so we changed, uh, we liked this new battleship location that we found with the the battleship memorial and we wrote a clue to fit there. So we ended up changing the route to stay on the west coast instead of going back over to the bay. And that actually shortened the route significantly as well. All right, we also removed a few things, uh, mostly because we just do things differently now than we did then. Um, so the big fish clue was a blinking light clue that uh, you could only view if it was dark and there was only two hours of darkness at the end of the event, so the fast teams kind of couldn't really solve it and were stuck waiting for the sun to go down. Um, also, even with four or five teams there, there was a bunching issue, and in the first event, the most teams we had in any week was 13, and we were hoping to run an event with you know, 20 teams, so we thought, can't do that clue at all. It's just not friendly for the, the type of event we want to do. And then the other event, the other, uh, activity we cut out was the remote control boats in Stowe Lake. Turns out that's totally illegal. <laughs> and uh, and we, don't, we don't break the law no more. So, <laughs> so we, we just cut that out. We did something else at Stowe Lake. Just, uh, yeah. It was fun though. That was a cool clue. But like, someday in a place where it's legal. All right. So then our big concern was, would anyone want to play in this event? We had to make it non-competitive because there were spoilers out there. In fact, our own website had descriptions of several of the clues for years, and our sample clue was the, the little fish clue from the scramble. So um, we took that down a while back, but still we knew that we had told a lot of people about this event and how it worked. Um, so we had to make it completely non-competitive, and there hadn't really been that many non-competitive events to that point. I, you know, that are, the, the big games are usually somewhat competitive. So we weren't sure if anyone really would care to play. Um, but luckily, a bunch of teams signed up. In fact, so many that we had to add a second weekend. So that was cool. We were very excited to have so many teams and, uh, and glad that they could have a fun experience. And, oh, and I also wanted to give a shout out to the gamers who had played before and had posted spoilers on their websites 
who either when they when we announced the next event they either took their spoilers down or put little signs at the top that said hey if you're playing don't read this and thank you so much it's awesome when people do that for us and uh, we really appreciate it thank you okay so here's our overall statistics between the two events the original Aquarius in 2004 ran three Saturdays for a total of 32 teams core GC was five people and it was 110 miles driving the remix was uh, two Saturdays with 35 teams. The core GC was just me and Brent and uh, 80 miles driving. So similar events, but uh, definitely a little more streamlined second time. So uh, my conclusion on this was, uh, was it worth it to resurrect an event from seven years ago? Mostly yes. Um, there we've got lots of new players. We were really impressed with how many new players came out and, uh, and gave it a try. And we got a chance to improve, hopefully improve, on uh, a lot of things that we had said, oh, if we were to ever do that again, I'd do it differently or whatever. So it's, it's fun to have that chance to, to fix problems from an event. Um, it was definitely a shorter lead time than an event from scratch, which was nice. We started, uh, I don't know, a month or two later, two months later than we would on a, an event from scratch. So that was nice. Um, the original players all came out, well, not all, but many, many original players helped us run the event, which was really incredible. It was very nice to, to have people come out and they remembered how the event went and they were excited to help and that was great. Uh, the cons, those poor original players didn't get a new event to play in last year from, from Shinteki, so sorry guys, uh, this year though. And uh, the other con, it was less creative work, but still a lot of work and maybe not as much fun as, as running a, your own event from scratch. But was it worth it? Yep, we're running Disneyland again. <laughs> so uh, apparently repeat events are, are totally worth it. We've got 30 some teams already signed up for Disneyland. So uh, definitely ready to do it again. But this year also Decathlon right. 7, I promise. <laughs> okay, all right, that's all I got. Any questions? So how did you track down the Nest Gallery just on the basis of you know, an empty lot. <laughs> so luckily the, uh, the antiques shop that was attached to that outdoor garden was still in business. And we went in there and said, hey, what happened to your awesome thing? And she said, oh, they're opening this new shop. It's, here's the address. And they had a, a little card with the address. So it was, it was pretty easy. We just whined about it till they told us where to go. <laughs> so, but we would have found something else in Half Moon Bay for sure. I mean. We had to have a stop in that area. So, Hi, Linda. Um, you commented on the lack of destruction clues and non-puzzly clues in current games. Um, do you think that's because people have less interest in them now? You, uh, you still, you've done some surveys. I know we still include them in a lot of the Microsoft intern-based events, but you're right, we don't see them in the other events. So is it because people don't want to? Uh, I don't know exactly. I, um, I think that it's, it's a gross generalization to say that they don't do them anymore. I think people certainly do have those, especially in the longer events, because you have time for more variety of puzzles. Um, I'd say our decathlon events that are just a half day long, we, we have streamlined that to be more puzzle centric. And that's a, that's a response to the surveys that we give out. Um, it, nobody writes and says, oh, my favorite clue was that one where we had to run around acting silly and not solve anything. So, uh, I, although some people probably think that, you guys should speak up if you think that, because I like those clues. But. Hi, I'm speaking up. <laughs> <laughs> you discovered that, I'm thinking about your files and the puzzles that you had. You discovered that you had to change the files to new file format. Did you find that you still had like the solutions and notes from all of your puzzles? <laughs> Did you have to resolve re some of your puzzles, or how how well do you is your uh, uh, recording here. Uh, I'm going to let Brent field that one. <laughs> Although I will tell you that we have had to resolve some of our older puzzles. To yeah, there was there was one that we absolutely had to resolve, and I swear I just banged my head on that thing for hours. Um, I did I did finally. It was it was one that Martin had written, so you guys can all revel in the fact that, that I got my comeuppance on that one. Um, yeah, it, it, that one was rough, but but for the most part, um, I've kept pretty good notes on on all that kind of stuff. Um, You'd think that if it's a puzzle you wrote, you'd be like, oh, yeah, of course I know what to do. But that's actually not always the case. If it's been that long, if you've written that many puzzles or seen solved that many puzzles by other people, it all just kind of becomes a blur. But uh, for the most part, um, pretty good, but not great. Nowadays, I am very 
uh, meticulous about making sure there's notes. So that, cause, because I know I, I might revisit these things for a corporate event or, or for recasting something or whatever, and I need to be able to get in there and find out what the heck I was thinking. So. So, so besides just taking a lot of notes, any other particular recommendations you might have to anybody else to be able to remember their own puzzles? Like any particular type of notes. So one other thing that we do is when we in-house play test, we have a play testing form that we keep track of and people write their thoughts. And it's it was originally designed for people to play test on their own when we weren't present, but we actually find it more useful when people, when we're there, that we take notes on the solvers. But you do end up getting a lot of good comments on there to remember the process of how it how it's solved. Cool. Actually, two things that I want to mention on that front as well. Um, Linda does an amazing job of of putting together little packets for the the location volunteers, and and a lot of times that'll sort of give the gist of how the puzzle works, so that the person there might be able to answer a basic question. It, it won't necessarily go into all the details, but it'll be enough that if you look at that, you can be like, oh yeah, okay, and I know what to do here. But one thing that I also do, which I found very helpful, is I will I always make a PDF of the final printed version of a puzzle and save that because then I know whatever machine I'm on or whenever whatever software evolutions have happened since then, I can just look at that PDF and, and just see what the puzzle looked like if it was just a basic printed puzzle. Got it. So that, that's been very helpful. So can you, without spoiling, uh, talk about how much work it's doing to revive the Disneyland event? Uh, Yes and no, uh, less, because we ran that only in 2009. So the majority of the puzzle styles are up to date. Also, that particular event uh, doesn't rely on the internet, so it relies on Disneyland. So the main changes on that one have been the changes that Disneyland Park has made, which we are dealing with right now. Um, but it's not that many. Disneyland is a classic place, and they don't change much. Um, Amazingly, I had like, I'm sending like the exact same emails to teams. Like I just copied the email from two years ago and send them the new information. It's uh, It's been really nice so far that I saved every little thing. Um, so yeah, so far easier. So would you do it again? Let's say you had another Aquarius era game, um, Decathlon 1 or something, and you wanted to revive it. Was it, was it worth the payoff to go through that grind and do it again? I think so. I think, yeah, you're just talking about tamed. <laughs> um, yeah, um, we we do think about rerunning our older events. I, I think originally we had only said, wouldn't it be cool to run Aquarius again? Because we liked that one. We liked the theme a lot. It was kind of our first half day event. Um, but I'd say we would consider rerunning the others um, later. Not uh, this year, Decathlon 7. Decathlon 7. <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, worth it in general, yes. And I would love to see people who ran their events years and years ago bring those back too, because a lot of people miss them and, and it's, there's a lot of new teams out there. So if you have an old event, think about bringing it back. So we, we've thought about um, rerunning some of our older, older events. We, we ran weekend long events for years and years before we started the one day events. And while there's no way we're going to rerun Jackpot, I, I would love to, but there's just no way. But um, we've looked at some of the even older ones and thought, you know, you could almost compact that and run it as a, as a one-day event now. Because, I mean, mm -hmm. the community has evolved so much that they could go through 30 hours of uh, mid-'90s puzzles. We could go through, you know, teams today could go through 30 hours of mid-'90s puzzles in, you know, 10 hours today. It's, it's amazing how, how much better the teams have gotten over the years. So we've thought about that. We'll see. So you talked about how Aquarius brought a lot of new teams into the, the community. Um, do, you, do you get a sense we're going to have those people stick and that's going to make have to run more and more multiple instances in order to accommodate the, the desire? Uh, I think that's somewhat true. It seems like there is more demand for events now. I, there's just the more teams play, the more teams want to play, right? Because the games are fun. Uh, so hopefully this will also mean more people running their own events and maybe we'll end up, uh, rather than having to run the same event three, four times just to accommodate all the teams, maybe people can start to choose what types of events they like best and sit out some and play some. Maybe they'll become so many events that you have to skip something. Um, and I think that's okay, too. You just pick the events you like best if we have enough people running different styles of events. So uh, Brent points out that maybe some of the older teams are gone now or have dissolved as well, which I think is true. So there's some attrition. 
Yeah, agreed. Um, so she just wanted to point out that a lot of the new teams who played have been playing for four or five years. But, you know, Aquarius was seven years ago. So a, a new team can have been playing for six years and, and still not played in Aquarius. So one, one quick follow-up on that. Um, for Disneyland, we've been excited about the number of teams that have signed up. We didn't really know how many we would get. I mean, we had, I think, somewhere in the 40s the first time. We've got about 35 right now, and we're hoping for a few more. But what we found is that a lot of those teams are kind of offshoot teams, you know, a, f a friend or a sister or, a, you know, just someone who hasn't really played in a regular event, partly because it's it's not a typical event. And I think that it potentially can appeal to a lot more people. And, and I think that's credit goes to Disneyland more so than to us for that. But I mean, but, you know, it's one of those things where where, you know, my mom would really enjoy playing in that game, whereas she really wouldn't want to get in the van with me. So um, so so, you know, so there's there's lots of different ways to look at at getting more teams and and recasting events and all that kind of stuff, so.